Chapter 8. What Indians Want What we need is a cultural leave-us-alone agreement, in spirit and in fact. Vine Deloria, Jr. Custer died for your sins. A future. What a good idea. But there's a problem. If native people are to have a future that is of our own making, such a future will be predicated, in large part, on sovereignty. Sovereignty is one of those topics about which everyone has an opinion, and each time the subject is brought up at a gathering or at a conference, a hockey game breaks out. To be honest, I'm reluctant to mention it. But if you're going to talk about Indians in contemporary North America, you're going to have to discuss sovereignty. No way around it. Sovereignty, by definition, is supreme and unrestricted authority. However, sovereignty in practice, as a functional form of governance, is never an absolute condition. Rather, it is a collection of practical powers that include, among others, the authority to levy taxes, set the criteria for citizenship, control trade, and negotiate agreements and treaties. Aboriginal sovereignty, by the way, is a given. It is recognized in treaties, in the Canadian and American constitutions, and in the Indian Act. It has been confirmed any number of times by Supreme Court decisions in both countries, just in case you didn't know. In 2007, the United Nations passed its Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, in which it recognized that Indigenous people had the right to self-determination and that they could freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. The Declaration doesn't use the word sovereignty, but the 46 articles that set out the rights and freedoms and responsibilities of Indigenous people are close enough to sovereignty, at least close enough for government work. The Canadian columnist Geoffrey Simpson in a Globe and Mail article in August of 2009, offered a more pragmatic approach to the subject of native sovereignty. We have been living a myth in Aboriginal policy, said Simpson, that nations, in the sociological sense of the word, can be effective sovereign entities in the sense of doing what sovereign governments are expected to do. When the population of a nation is a few hundred people, or even a few thousand, we are kidding ourselves, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, if we think that sovereignty can be anything more than partial. The Cherokee Creek scholar Craig Womack is less dismissive and more practical. Sovereignty, for all its problems and contradictions, says Womack, is a reality in Indian country, embedded in the U.S. Constitution and two centuries of federal Indian law. In short, it is what native people have to work with, the hand that has been dealt us. This, of course, does not mean native people should not dream of more or even advocate for more, but present realities must also be acknowledged. One of the realities that Simpson may have missed is that the Navajo in the Southwest, the Blackfoot in Alberta, and the Mohawk on both sides of the border have been looking after their own affairs for some time now. All three tribes have taken control of on-reserve services for health, education, and housing. Meanwhile, the Iroquois have been practicing sovereignty by issuing and using their own Haudenosaunee Confederacy passports. In 2009, the National Congress of American Indians, NCAI, finished work on the Embassy of Tribal Nations in Washington, D.C., at the opening ceremony, President Jefferson Keel said he expected that the embassy would allow Native people to more effectively assert their sovereign status and facilitate a much stronger nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the federal government. Even American President Barack Obama has spoken publicly about the nation-to-nation -nation relationship that North America has with Indian tribes. It all sounds good. Of course, government has been only too happy to download services onto reservations and reserves. Ottawa and Washington still control the budgets and set the regulations, 
while avoiding most of the liabilities. The issuing of passports is legitimate exercise of sovereignty, but in 2010, when the Iroquois Nationals lacrosse team tried to travel to Manchester for the International Lacrosse Championships on those documents, they were refused entry into England. They had been able to cross from Canada to the United States on their passports, but that was only because Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had interceded in the matter and arranged for a one-time waiver. In the end, however, instead of playing in the tournament, the team wound up watching television at a comfort inn in New York. The Embassy of Tribal Nations is a fine idea, and to hear President Obama speak the word sovereignty in the same breath as the word Indian is certainly encouraging, even though we all know that political rhetoric has little to do with political action. But more telling, to my way of thinking, is the 2010 radio show during which New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg called on New York Governor David Patterson to take a more proactive approach to the state's dispute with the Seneca tribe over the collection of sales tax on cigarettes. I've said this to David Patterson, said Bloomberg. Get yourself a cowboy hat and a shotgun. If there's ever a great video, it's you standing in the middle of the New York State Thruway saying, read my lips. The law of the land is this, and we're going to enforce the law. That Mayor Bloomberg, such a funny guy, reminds me a lot of John Wayne in The Searchers. The American historian David Wilkins is direct and to the point. The relationship, says Wilkins, between American Indian tribes and the U.S. federal government is an ongoing contest over sovereignty. And while there are no clear winners at this moment, the reality is that, no matter what the historical and legal precedents, neither Canada nor the United States has much enthusiasm for recognizing any varietals of native sovereignty. Both governments are concerned with cutting the cost of native affairs. They are certainly concerned with reducing the Indian estate, but they have shown little interest in prolonging the authority of treaties and none whatsoever in encouraging standalone sovereign or semi-sovereign nations within the borders of either country. Ask Quebec about that one, if you don't believe me, or take a refresher course on the American Civil War. Indeed, one of the contentions currently in vogue is that native people in North America need to be rescued from reserves and reservations, the Indian Act, the Department of Indian Affairs, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Aboriginal people have suffered unduly from government interference and bureaucratic oppression, so the thinking goes, and the only solution is to abrogate treaties, eliminate federal guarantees, divide First Nations land into fee-simple blocks, and allow Native people to participate freely in the economic markets that Western capitalism has created. Tribes are obsolete forms of governance. Treaties are an obstacle to native, non-native rapprochement. Rapprochement. There's nothing like a French word thrown in every now and then to give an argument poissance. This is the 21st century, after all. We no longer tolerate child labor. Family-owned convenience stores don't count. We have done away with public executions. Capital punishment is conducted humanely in state-approved facilities. Women have gained control of their reproductive rights, for the time being at least. And having made these strides, why should individual enterprise be limited or Western civilization's advance be hindered by ancient agreements and promises? Slade Gorton, the Washington state politician, made a political career out of pursuing a termination vendetta against the tribes in his state and around the nation. In 1998, Gorton sponsored a Senate bill, which he disingenuously called the American Indian Equal Justice Act. The legislation was a direct attack on tribal sovereignty. Item 8 under Findings argued that the idea of Native sovereignty frustrates and provokes social tensions and turmoil inimicable to social peace, 
while Item 9 called on Congress to do away with Indian sovereignty because no government should be above the law. The New York Times was not amused. Senator Slade Gorton, the article said, has once again declared war on the Indians. Having failed last year to undermine the concept of Indian sovereignty with a sneaky amendment to an appropriations bill, the Washington State Republican has now offered a freestanding bill, erroneously labeled the American Indian Equal Justice Act, that is a reprise of last year's rider. To his credit, Gorton did not stand with the angry mobs who gathered in Wisconsin in 1989 to throw rocks at Indians and shout racial epithets, including old favorites such as timber niggers and newer creations such as welfare warriors. Nor did he hold up one of the signs that said, Save a fish, spear a squaw. Save two fish, spear a pregnant squaw. Still, he probably agreed with Washington State Senator Jack Metcalf's 1983 Senate Joint Memorial that urged Congress to abrogate all existing treaties, and the resolution that John Fleming introduced at the 2000 Washington State Republican Convention that called for the termination of all tribal governments in the state. Fleming bragged that if the tribes resisted such an effort, then the U.S. Army and the Air Force and the Marines and the National Guard are going to have to battle back. You might want to write Fleming off as a clown and his resolution as a piece of political rhetoric, but the resolution passed on a vote of 248 in favor and two against and became part of that state's Republican Party platform. One of Neo-Termination's strongest supporters is Thomas Flanagan, a University of Calgary political science professor and author of First Nations, Second Thoughts, and Beyond the Indian Act. Flanagan has little patience with treaties and native status and has argued vigorously in his role as educator and as an advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper for the dissolution of Indian reserves and federal status. Call it assimilation, call it integration, call it adaptation, says Flanagan. Call it whatever you want. It has to happen. Adherents to Flanagan's particular vision for Indians in the 21st century are adamant that Aboriginals should not be entitled to self-determination to any degree, in any form, nor should they receive federal funding or qualify for special tax exemptions. Closing down the Department of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they contend, would save billions of dollars a year. But most of all, these latter-day terminators want tribal lands taken out from under the protections of treaties, turned into fee-simple parcels, and turned loose on the prairies. Where the properties can be picked off by real estate agents or shot at from moving trains. All else considered, the main attraction of this line of reasoning is that it is simplistic and requires no negotiation or compromise. Let's get rid of Indians as a legal entity, and let's do it now. But why would we want to repeat the mistakes of the past? Why drag a failed policy such as termination out of its grave, when history has already shown us that this particular strategy was an utter disaster? For Indians and for Whites Why argue for closing the Department of Indian Affairs, or the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or for dismantling the Indian Act, when the problem is not simply the legislation, but how it has been interpreted and employed. Speaking specifically of the Indian Act, Harold Cardinal, in his 1969 bestseller, The Unjust Society, said, We do not want the Indian Act retained because it is a good piece of legislation. It isn't. It is discriminatory from start to finish but it is a lever in our hands and an embarrassment to the government, as it should be. No just society, and no society with even pretensions to being just, can long tolerate such a piece of legislation, but we would rather continue to live in bondage under the inequitable Indian Act than surrender our sacred rights. Any time the government wants to honor its obligations to us, we are more than ready to help devise new Indian legislation. In 2010, 
Assembly of First Nations National Chief Sean Atlio echoed Cardinal's earlier concerns about the Indian Act and began a running discussion on how the Act might be abolished and what would replace it. Atlio points out, quite rightly, that the treaties and the body of Aboriginal rights that have been formally recognized under international law and under Section 35 of Canada's 1982 Constitution Act could form a usable structure for a working relationship between First Nations and the federal government. While I haven't heard him say so, this is the same framework that was used in the early days, before the Indian Act and assimilation came along. It's a great idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. Treaties and native rights have one fatal flaw. They are predicated on Aboriginal sovereignty. And while Ottawa and Washington can imagine a world in which federal responsibility for Indians has been eliminated, neither will countenance any deal that revisits the question of native sovereignty. It took both countries long enough to bury the concept. They're not about to buy a shovel and dig it up. None of this debate around native rights, self-determination, and sovereignty is particularly new. Even Eli S. Parker, Seneca, the first Native American to be Commissioner of Indian Affairs, had concerns about Native sovereignty. In his 1869 report, Parker offered that the Indian tribes of the United States are not sovereign nations capable of making treaties, as none of them have an organized government of such inherent strength as would secure a faithful obedience of its people in the observance of compacts of this character. The year before Parker wrote his report, the U.S. government had signed the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Lakota, which guaranteed them the exclusive use of the Black Hills. Nine years later, after gold had been discovered, Parker watched as non-natives flooded into the Black Hills, watched as the government stood by unable to secure a faithful obedience of its people in the observance of compacts of this character. In 1877, Parker was on hand when Washington unilaterally confiscated the Black Hills and turned the land over to the white miners and settlers. Parker died in 1895. By then, the United States had become quite efficient at breaking the agreements and the promises it had made with Native people. Perhaps by then Parker realized the irony of his earlier observation. Perhaps he understood that sovereignty had little to do with the ability of a nation to control its people. The wonderful irony of Aboriginal sovereignty is that if we collected the Indian Act, the treaties, the Canadian and U.S. Constitutions, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the U.S. Bill of Rights, all the Supreme Court decisions, along with the cases that the Canadian Human Rights Commission has generated, we would have a composite and contradictory manuscript, much like the Bible. A manuscript in which both saints and scoundrels can find satisfaction and validation for contrary principles and beliefs in the same passage, where they can find a precedent for every comfort and every larceny. But perhaps discussing sovereignty as an absolute concept is a waste of time. Perhaps we should concern ourselves instead with practical sovereignty and ask the question, what part of sovereignty is critical to Aboriginal nations in North America? Each nation will, of course, have to answer that for itself. However, seeing as my advice is free, and as I'm more than happy to give it, I suggest that we concentrate on the issues of tribal membership and resource development. I'd even go further and propose that these two topics may well be two of the more important issues of the 21st century for Aboriginal people in North America. Membership in an Aboriginal nation is a somewhat bewildering combination of federal legislation, federal treaties and agreements, blood quantum, and 19th century enumeration lists, along with tribal regulations and customs. In Canada, the Indian Act, along with the treaties, set some of the terms of reference for banned membership, while in the United States, membership, in part, is based on federal recognition of a tribe and the lists that the government created to keep track of Aboriginal people. In Canada, as we saw earlier, Native people are divided, 
more or less, into three categories, status Indians, treaty Indians, and non-status Indians. In most instances, status Indians and treaty Indians are the same, legal Indians. Non-status Indians are simply not Indians, or more accurately, not legal Indians. In the United States, legal Indians are members of a tribe that is recognized by the federal government, while the rest of Native people in that country are, like their counterparts in Canada, not Indians. In fact, with the passage of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act in 1990, Native artists who produce and sell their work cannot call themselves by their tribal affiliation unless they are official members of the tribe. To do so is to risk fines of up to $250,000. The Arts and Crafts Act was designed to stop the trade and counterfeit native art that unscrupulous dealers were bringing in from places such as Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and India, and in this regard, the act was a welcome law. But the unfortunate side effect of the act was to terminate a great many native artists who were Indians by blood, but who, for a variety of reasons, were not official members of a tribe. Many of them had home communities, Many of them had blood relatives living in those communities, yet under the terms of the act, they could be prosecuted for claiming they were who they were because, legally, they weren't. Jimmy Durham is one such artist. He's Cherokee, but because he can't legally say he's Cherokee, he's not. I probably shouldn't have mentioned this since it may be illegal for me to, you know, say this. Durham himself is somewhat circumspect about the issue of identity. I'm a full-blood contemporary artist, says Durham, of the subgroup, or clan, called sculptors. I am not a Native American, nor do I feel that America has any right to either name me or unname me. I have previously stated that I should be considered a mixed blood. That is, I claim to be a male, but in fact only one of my parents was a male. Today, almost all Aboriginal nations control their memberships. While the rules and regulations differ from tribe to tribe, band to band, the general requirement is that a blood relationship exists between a registered Indian or an ancestor on the tribal rolls and an individual seeking membership. Sometimes there is a blood quantum requirement as well. The Blackfoot in Alberta and the Comanche in Oklahoma, for example, currently require that in addition to a blood tie, their members be at least one-quarter blood. But they could, if they wished, lower that blood quantum requirement or dispense with it altogether. This is what the Ottawa, Seminole, Wyandot, Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw have done. For these tribes and others, any descendant of a tribal member is also entitled to be a member of the tribe, regardless of blood quantum. But there can be other factors as well. The Cherokee, for example, have 15 tribal roles that were created between 1817 and 1914. A great many Cherokee can trace their family back to a name on one of these roles, but unless your ancestor appears on the 1924 Baker Rolls that cover the Eastern Cherokee, or the 1898 to 1914 Dawes Guyon Miller Rolls that cover the Western Cherokee, you cannot qualify for membership in one of the three federally recognized Cherokee tribes the Eastern Cherokee, the Western Cherokee, and the United Kituwa Band. Neither the Baker nor the dawes Guion miller rolls are a comprehensive or complete compilation of Cherokee families, but these rolls are the only sources that the tribe uses for determining who can be a citizen of the nation. The Kituwa, to complicate things further, require that a member be one-quarter blood and have an ancestor on either the Dawes rolls or the United Kituwa Band base roll which was created in 1949. Up until about 1994, the Kituwa also gave associate memberships to Cherokees who could not demonstrate via the rolls that they were Cherokee, and they gave associate memberships to folks who were famous or influential, 
such as Bill Clinton. Some of the associate members were given an enrollment card with a number, but these associate members could not appear on the official Kituwa tribal rolls, nor could they receive any federal benefits. Just in case you thought membership in a native nation was a straightforward thing. Currently, the trend among bands and tribes in North America is to try to limit membership. The land base and the resources that native people control are finite. But Aboriginal populations continue to grow, and the thinking is that tribal assets should only be used for the benefit of those who are authentic, a term that is fraught with dangerous assumptions and consequences. Among the Cherokee, you have Cherokees who are Cherokee by blood and who have an ancestor on their required roles, and you have Cherokees who are Cherokee by blood but whose ancestors were not listed on the required roles. The one group is authentic, the other group is not. To my way of thinking, such a distinction is self-serving and self-defeating at the same time. In Canada, where First Nations people are defined by the Indian Act, there is currently no possibility for creating new status Indians, apart from birth. Bans may grant membership to non-status Indians and even to non-Indians, and it's possible that these individuals could be given the right to vote in banned elections and allowed to live on Indian land, though the jury is still out on the question of residency. But they could not share in any benefits that came to the tribe by way of the Indian Act or a treaty. Sovereignty allows that Aboriginal nations can either erect barriers to membership or lower those barriers and create new opportunities for citizenship. There are arguments to be made for both of these approaches. Barriers can create security. Numbers can create strength. In the 21st century conversation around tribal membership, I hope that Aboriginal nations use this sovereign power with intelligence and generosity. After membership, the second question that Native people have to consider with regards to sovereignty is how we go about creating an economic base for reserves and reservations. If the statistics are correct, there are almost as many native people on reserves as off-reserves, and while off-reservation native-run businesses are important to the overall health of native as well as non-native communities, the development and expansion of on-reservation enterprise is critical if we expect to maintain our communities and our land base. Up to this point, while reserves and reservations with a large land base have had more economic choices than those with a small land base, the range of the choices itself has been limited, and some of the choices have been downright disquieting. Garbage dumps, for example. In the late 1980s and 1990s, North America decided that native land would be a perfect place to dump its garbage. Waste management companies that handle everything from non-hazardous materials to nuclear waste began riding into Indian country armed with beads and promises, hell-bent on convincing tribal leaders that turning part of the reservation into a landfill was good economics. This scenario made for excellent theater of the absurd, with the waste management companies suddenly championing native rights and tribal sovereignty. Not that these companies gave a damn about native sovereignty, but they were excited by the prospect that the legal status of Indian land might protect them from the tyranny of environmental regulations. I don't want to suggest that native communities were simply victims in this, or that they were completely opposed to the enterprise of garbage disposal. Many reservations were so poor that any business was good business. From small tribes such as the Campo Band of Mission Indians just outside San Diego to larger groups such as the Chickasaw and Sock and Fox in Oklahoma, the Yakima in Washington, and the Mescalero Apache in New Mexico, First Nations began approaching companies on their own to talk about joint ventures that would create commercial landfills on trust land and generate much-needed money for the community. The garbage issue was, as might be expected, controversial, and the debate split many of the tribes. 
What was mildly amusing was watching environmentalists and concerned non-natives lecture Indians on traditional beliefs and ethical standards. While native people have, for a long time now, been adversely affected by white development near reservations and reserves, the mercury poisonings at Grassy Narrows in northern Ontario, the General Motors landfill near Aquasosne, the draining of Pyramid Lake in Nevada, the Kinzua Dam in Pennsylvania, the level of concern seems far greater, the reaction more intense, when white communities are faced with the consequences of native development. John Dossett, the General Counsel for the National Congress of American Indians, sees the land use battles as a reflection of race and privilege. It is more than a little unfair, says Dossett, that tribes, who have been among the last to receive the benefits of economic development, would be expected to keep their lands pristine while everyone has developed all around them. For a tribe such as the Navajo, the benefits of economic development and the need to protect the land are parts of a long-running deliberation. So far, economic development has carried the day. The Navajo have, since the 1940s, been involved in resource mining. While most of Navajo country is desert, it is also home to major deposits of uranium and even larger deposits of coal. In 1948, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission set off a mining boom in New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona when it announced that it would purchase all uranium ore at a guaranteed price. Uranium meant jobs for the Navajo. No one talked about the hazards of uranium, though the science in and around radon gas, particularly by the 1950s, was reasonably well established. Nor did anyone discuss with the tribe the bottom-line costs to the environment and to the lives of the people who worked in the mines. Then, in July of 1976, a few months after the partial meltdown of the nuclear reactor at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, a dam at the United Nuclear Corporation's Church Rock facility in New Mexico, on the edge of the Navajo Reservation, collapsed, and over 1,100 tons of radioactive waste and 93 million gallons of mine effluent poured into the Porco River, permanently contaminating the river and the water supply. Three Mile Island got all the press, but Church Rock was a much larger ecological disaster, and when the Navajo finally banned uranium and uranium processing on the reservation in 2005, all they were left with for their efforts at creating a working economy was a deadly legacy of contaminated tailings, polluted water supplies, abandoned mines, and chronic illness. In addition to uranium deposits, the Navajo Nation has one of the largest coal mining operations in the world. The royalties that the Navajo receive from Peabody Energy account for most of the tribe's annual budget. As well, coal mining, along with the attendant industries, provides jobs for thousands of Navajo. But as with uranium, the downside of this industry is huge. If anything, Coal is even more polluting than uranium. The Four Corners Power Plant, which came online in 1963, operates outside normal regulations, without any significant limits on its emissions. By any measure, Four Corners is an environmental nightmare, emitting over 15 million tons of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and carbon dioxides each year, as well as some 600 pounds of mercury. No other power plant in the United States puts more pollutants into the air and the water than Four Corners. It's in a category all by itself. The Navajo and Hopi reservations used to have some of the cleanest air in the country. Now because of Four Corners and the other coal-burning power plants in the Southwest, air pollution on the reservations is at least ten times worse than in a city such as Los Angeles. I have great concerns about resource mining on native lands, and I don't much like the idea of reserves and reservations being used as landfills. It all feels too much like colonialism part two. I understand that these projects generate much needed revenues for many Aboriginal communities who are living at poverty levels. 
But I also know that once the resource is gone and the dumps are filled, all that native people will have to pass on to their children will be a blasted and poisoned landscape. There has been a great deal of talk about the prospects of solar, wind, and tidal surge energy on Indian reserves and reservations. The Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico, the Cowessess First Nation in Saskatchewan, the Assiniboine and the Sioux in Fort Peck, Montana, the Blackfeet in Browning, Montana, the Sioux Nation near Sioux, British Columbia, the Spirit Lake Sioux at Fort Totten, North Dakota, and the Shiging First Nation and the Wikwemekong First Nation on Manitoulin Island are all engaged in renewable energy projects that may make the transition from demonstration projects to full-blown industries. Which brings us back to the previous chapter and the growth of Aboriginal gaming. Compared to commercial landfills, resource mining, aluminum processing, nuclear waste storage and waste incineration, Indian ventures in gaming and tourism are relatively pristine activities with a limited impact on the physical environment. But I'm not going to suggest that the economic development of Aboriginal resorts and casinos is an improvement. The potential downside of gaming, alcohol, drugs, prostitution, gambling addiction, organized crime, may be just as damaging as a toxic holding pond. But casinos and the large amounts of money that they generate have allowed certain tribes to do something I never thought I'd ever see. I knew that Indian gaming was big business. I knew that many casinos were making a healthy profit from slot machines, bingos, blackjack, and the like. What I didn't know was what tribes were doing with the profits. I assumed that band councils were giving part of the profits to the members of the tribe as per capita payments or spending it on much-needed infrastructure or buying stocks and bonds as long-term investments. And they were. But they were also buying land. In upstate New York, the Oneida Nation has used some of the money made from its Turning Stone Resort and Casino to purchase over 17,000 acres of land. In Minnesota, the Shakopee Sioux have taken money from their Mystic Lake Casino Hotel, have bought 750 acres, and are looking at another 1,000 acres. The Cherokee in Oklahoma have purchased acreage along the major highways in that state, while the Sikuyan Band of the Kumeyaay Nation in Southern California is buying up land in downtown San Diego and the surrounding area. But instead of pursuing the American dream of accumulating land as personal wealth, the tribes have taken their purchases to the Secretary of the Interior and requested that the land they acquired be added to their respective reservations and given trust status. This is not merely a return to a communal past. It is a shrewd move to preserve and expand an indigenous land base for the benefit of future generations. This type of purchase and conversion is now being emulated by tribes across the United States. In 2003, the Tohono O'odham Nation purchased a 130-acre parcel of land in Glendale, Arizona. The land was converted from fee simple to trust land, and the tribe is making plans to build a $600 million casino on the site. This acquisition has caused no small amount of consternation for politicians in Glendale, who watched as a perfectly good block of fee-simple land was taken out of local and state control and removed from the tax base. Raising the western specter of wild and uncontrolled Indians, Craig Tyndall, the city attorney, warned, as soon as people step off that land into our jurisdiction, we have to deal with them, whatever condition they are in. When they come off that land, it's up to us. I had assumed that the people Tinda was talking about were Indians, and that his comments were just an intemperate outburst. But now that I think about it, I wonder if he was expressing concern about white Glendalians returning to the city after an evening of fun and frolic at the Tohono O'odham Nation Casino. The fact that the casino will create a great many permanent jobs and stimulate the local economy has not been lost on city planners, 
but the thought of a reservation on the edge of Glendale has been too much for local bureaucrats. In 2010, the city sued the federal government, charging that the 1986 federal law that allowed the Tohono O'odham, as well as other tribes, to acquire new reservation property was unconstitutional. But I shouldn't pick on Glendale. All around America, local reaction to tribes buying up property and having the land converted to trust status has been predominantly negative. Almost 150 years ago, then Secretary of the Interior, Carl Schertz, said, Many treaty reservations have turned out to be of greater value in agricultural and mineral resources than they were originally thought to be, and are now eagerly coveted by the white population. It is argued that the Indians cannot and will not develop these resources, that the country cannot afford to maintain large and valuable districts in a state of waste. This demand becomes more pressing every year, and although in many cases urged entirely without regard to abstract justice, it is a fact, which must be taken into account in shaping an Indian policy. This 19th century complaint that native people weren't using their land base and developing the resources in an acceptable fashion and the veiled warning that Indian land was eagerly coveted by the white population remain potent factors in contemporary Indian white politics. Glendale's anger is not simply over the new reservation and casino at the edge of town. It is over the fact that the land in question is owned by Indians and no longer available to the city. So far, reserves in Canada have not tried to follow the American example. Any expansion of First Nation lands would have to come via land claim settlements or parliamentary decrees. But it would be interesting to see what might happen if, for example, the Ojibwe at Rama bought up some of the land on the outskirts of Aurelia, Ontario, and attempted to expand their reserve. This new twist on land has just begun to play its way through the courts in the United States and may not be settled in my lifetime. However the matter turns out, I can't help but enjoy the irony. North Americans, all along, have believed that private ownership of land would turn Indians into whites, while Native people have learned that the control of land can allow us to remain ourselves. What remains distressing is that much of what passes for public and political discourse on the future of Native people is a discourse of anger, anger that Native people are still here and still a problem for white North America, anger that we have something non-Natives don't have, anger that after all the years of training, after all the years of having assimilation beaten into us, we still prefer to remain Cree and Comanche, Seminole and Salish, Haida and Hopi, Blackfoot and Bellicola. All of which brings us to the perennial North American question. Just what is it that Indians want? Sovereignty? Self-determination? A future? Good jobs? A late model pickup truck? I get asked that question all the time. What do Indians want? The good news is that you could choose from any of the above and be right. And you'd be wrong.